All right, Kotlin Cough, we are back, baby. Hello, good morning. Woo! Four years is a long time. All right, thank you for that. Uh, my name is Wynne Duet Dow. I am an Android developer. I'm a Kotlin developer, and I absolutely love Kotlin uh, still after four years. Really glad to be back. So, I think I, if I tallied up, I've been using Kotlin for about, let's see, 2000, I think November 2016 was when I actually started my first Kotlin file, so whatever that math is, six and a half years. And I find myself still, six and a half years later, asking a very particular question. And it's kind of something that kind of came up, you know, when, when I started learning about Kotlin, and that is, what is idiomatic Kotlin? Can everyone read that? Okay, I know it's small, like, okay in the back. Can you read it all right? Do you want me to make it bigger? Okay, great, thank you very much. So what is idiomatic Kotlin? I, I still have trouble defining this, and so what do we do when we have trouble defining things? We go to the dictionary. And what does the word idiomatic mean? Well, it would be really great for me to pat up my time if I just read you the entire dictionary <laughs> definition, but basically, idiomatic in terms of the English language has a lot to do with relating to or conforming to idioms or just basically peculiar, um, peculiar to a particular group, individual, or, st or style, and idiom it has several definitions. They all have more or less to do with the idea of syntax versus semantics. That's probably not what it says, but as, a, as an engineer, I'm going to interpret it that way. But basically, the idea of an idiom is perhaps, you know, something that, you know, in terms of language, in terms of words, is more than the sum of its parts, right? And there could also be just more simple definitions of just literally the syntax of a language, the grammar of a language, and also a language particular to a group of people. So what does idiomatic Kotlin mean in this regard? Well, it seems like it has something to do with syntax, something to do with semantics, and the peculiarities of a lovely group of people like yourselves, ourselves, Kotlin users. And, you know, what, so what does that mean, right? What does it mean to write idiomatic Kotlin? And a lot of the, the ways that I have kind of tried to process Process this is through coincidentally the last uh, Kotlin, Kotlin Conf keynote that was in this building, and that was in 2018 by then lead Andre Breslov. And it was a really great keynote. It kind of it kind of really impacted how I think about Kotlin because you know he Andre kind of went through the goals of Kotlin and, and basically said, yeah, our main motto was to make a pragmatic language. And you know there was a lot of hype, a lot of great feeling, a lot of excitement, at least kind of where I was in terms of like the developer space around Kotlin. And I think Andre made some really good points of reviewing kind of all these good things that people say about Kotlin and focusing on the things that they value on the team readability over concision, you know, reuse over expressiveness, and interoperability over originality of features, and sa safety and tooling over something that is soundness, which is a little bit too academic for me. But I always kind of try to keep these concepts in mind when I write my own Kotlin code, and maybe by following these principles, I can be more idiomatic. So, but there's still this level. So that's kind of, in a sense, semantics and conventions. But there's still a problem of syntax. And so it's been a long four years since we've been back here. And I think it'd be, well, it's fun for me to kind of look over some of the newish features that have popped up in Kotlin since then. And I have four years to work with, so it's a lot of material. But I wanted to take us through some of the improvements, new features in Kotlin, kind of dissect them and see if there's anything in there that can, t that can either maybe direct us to idiomatic Kotlin or maybe decide sometimes whether idiomatic Kotlin is the Kotlin for us. So let's just go ahead and dive in. So I'm already cheating here a little bit. Sealed interface, <laughs> sealed classes are not new, but there are some pieces, some enhancements to sealed classes that are new, and that in particular are sealed interfaces, which came out in Kotlin 1.5.0. Uh, so let me pop this open a little bit. So like many people in the last <clears throat> few years, for various reasons, I've been watching a lot of movies. So let's say that I wanted to write an app where I kind of controlled, monitored my film watching, and I want, I, you know, in particular, especially since they're so bingeable, I've been watching a lot of film franchises. And so I want to write a sealed class hierarchy for this. So sealed class hierarchies are basically restricted hierarchies. They are a series of classes, interfaces, that's a spoiler, and, the, and subclasses that extend and implement these classes and interfaces. And the advantage is, is that the way that we define sealed classes and the kind of rules by which we abide, we can actually tell the compiler at compile time the entire, you know, 
tree, the entire family of classes within a sealed class hierarchy. So that brings us certain advantages. So I just want to kind of go over, over my little sealed class here. Again, I like movies a lot. So I have a sealed class that's about film franchises. Probably the most important thing about film fra franchises is, of course, how many films there are. So I know how many hours of content I have before I have to actually get up and, you know, change to different streaming service. There's thousands of them now, so probably not too hard. And, you know, I have specific data classes here that are extending that film franchise. So SEAL classes are abstract, and so they cannot be instantiated, of course, on their own, but I have a few couple of data classes here. One is for a horror film series, and one is for a post-apocalyptic film series. You can tell, like, I really love, like, positive, energetic, like, fun movies. And, you know, there's different, you know, there's both kind of the inherited abstract property of the film count, and there's also kind of some, uh, some more specific properties to those data classes, like whether the post-apocalyptic film series is mediocre or not. And it, within a sealed class hierarchy, you don't just necessarily have data classes or regular classes. You can have object declarations. So the difference is, of course, is that if you have a data class or a class, you can have multiple instances of these class in existence, right, in a different state within those different instances. But in a SEAL class, you, of course, you're also allowed to create object declarations, which are more or less constants within that SEAL class hierarchy. So here I have a couple of films that uh, film franchises that I, you know, personally like a little bit. And yeah, so I have both the idea of these kind of single instances within the sealed, hi sealed class hierarchy, as well as more traditional data classes with multiple instances. So the advantage of sealed classes, of course, which hopefully um, if you've been using Kotlin for any time at all you, that you are aware of, is that because the compiler is aware of the entire extent of this restricted class hierarchy, you get a couple of perks, and probably the most, you know, obvious one, or probably the one that most of us use quite often, is, you know, being able to have the entire, like, possible, you know, branching uh, of one statement added for us. So, say I just wanted to, you know, make myself feel bad about how many movies I've been watching, and I want to print out, like, each, you know, franchise as a list, maybe different formatting for the different genres. So, I might have a one statement like this, where I might kind of, I don't want to say switch, it's not a switch, of course, but I might want to branch off of the, the type within that franchise variable. And of course, right now I have a compiler error, error because the compiler knows all of the classes in my sealed hierarchy and I'm missing all of them. And so what I can do is go ahead and have the compiler, or rather the IDE, go ahead and add you know, all of the possible you know, conditions for me to the when. Awesome, right? I, and there's nothing that I had to do to manage that. So is there some very particular magic that is happening behind the scenes to allow us this, you know, this kind of safety, this being able to cover all kind of courses without having to, resu to resort to that dang else statement? Well, to answer that, I called this dissecting Kotlin. And sometimes dissecting Kotlin means looking at bytecode. So I want to take what I like to call a b -b -b bytecode break and take a look at what is actually happening under the hood with this sealed class, and in particular, what's going on with that one. So I said I'm going to do bytecode, but I actually kind of cheat a bit, and I will take the bytecode and then decompile it back just so I can read it a little better. And if I scroll all the way down to this one, you can see here, oh, no magic. It's just, again, because the compiler is aware of this restricted class hierarchy and all of the subclasses in it, it can do this horrid, <laughs> horrible work of this huge cascading S if else for you, and it manages that for you rather than you having to stay up until 3 a.m. figuring out whether you missed something or not. Uh, and then again, that is kind of, you know, very, very typical Kotlin nicety, right? That the compiler is smart enough to figure things out for us and let us kind of deal with high-level details rather than all this nonsense. Um, it's not nonsense, but I wouldn't want to write it. Uh, and yeah, so that is sealed classes. Of course, as I mentioned in 1.50, we got a very nice addition to you know, this concept of restricted class hierarchies, and that is the sealed interface. So abstract classes are great, but you know, inheritance is a bit limited, right? Because whereas you can have a class extend multiple, multiple interfaces, you know, it can only ever inherit from one class. So that can get kind of restricted. And I don't know about you, but I know I've written some I have to call it degenerate, that's really a bit mean, but kind of some very weird sealed class only hierarchies to try to get, you know, different behaviors in different parts of my, you know, nice uh, sealed class tree, but no longer. So say that I actually kind of wanted to get really fancy here and start having something like different interfaces to talk about I mean, the subgenres of my movies. So if I have something like this, 
And then what was the key to that? Sorry, one second. Let me try to close everything uh, so it's easier to read. Is that it? OK, there we go. So say that I wanted to add some other interfaces, some other behaviors, descriptors on you know, just different axes by which I can kind of classify and work with this data. And I have these you know, kind of two little you know, mini interface you know, hierarchies. They're fine, they work, but they're not sealed. They're not participating in that restricted hierarchy. So if I come down here, um, and because I have lost that ability, if I go ahead and I'm actually kind of branching and switching on something that is more, say I'm really curious about what kind of adaptations am I watching? Am I watching comic book adaptations, which it seems hard to not do, it just, it just kind of come at you on the street. Or if you know maybe I like reading young, young adult books and I want to know the adaptation, maybe I want to switch on that, or sorry, uh, when on that. And um, you can see here, I don't actually have a compiler error. I just have the compiler complaining at me that, oh, you don't have anything in here. And it's because, of course, because these interfaces are not sealed, the compiler doesn't know if someone else, you know, in another module in another town somewhere, you know, extended these interfaces. So it cannot give you, it, can, it cannot guarantee, you know, a knowledge of the full extent of any single class. And so it can't actually give you that, you know, exhaustive win. But if with 1.50, um, and actually I'm going to uh, rewrite all of this, um, we can add sealed interfaces to kind of our sealed class hierarchy, restricted hierarchy tool bag. And let me just change this up and we'll just cut to the good part. And so now, you know, uh, I I'm not restricted to just the abstract class. I can kind of create a lot more wide. And let me try to get rid of, which command did I do? There we go. Um, so now I have, you know, an even bigger restricted uh, hierarchy uh, where the compiler can tell all of these different weird categorizations that I have. Uh, and I have the freedom to both, you know, choose abstract classes or interfaces. And it's really cool in that, you know, it's not, that the restricted hierarchy, that ability for the compiler to kind of, you know, recognize what are the possible you know, types here, extend them on multiple axes, right? So I have my original film franchise, but I have, you know, like this other hierarchy that's about adaptation, what kind of adaptation is. Maybe it's a comedy, some of them might not be comedy, so I have that flexibility to kind of selectively, you know, apply different interfaces to portions of my sealed hierarchy. So it's a lot more flexible, it's really awesome, and yeah, it was a long time coming. I know uh, my sealed hierarchies look a lot better now. And so, Let's take a look again at these two objects, right? These two object de declarations. So I have a warning, and that is because I have selected uh, Kotlin language version 1.9, and in 1.9 there is actually the data object available. So what was kind of nice about sealed classes, of course, is that you can you know, very flexibly use regular classes and data classes, and data classes, of course, give you all those nice for free generated methods that usually we find a pain to write, like hash code to string, etc. Unfortunately, if you really liked using object declarations, which I know I do, the objects themselves don't you know, get any of that, any of those perks, at least not until turning on 1.9 and adding data objects. So before, say like this object down here, it wouldn't have any of those generated, you know, niceties that data class has because it's just an ob object declaration. But now um, with, you know, uh, 1.9, I have this data object and that data object is pro providing some of the benefits of the data class to the declared object. And let me go ahead and fix my code here. And so now we have a very nice hierarchy of film franchises as well as kind of categorization. We'll just leave that typo, that's fine. Um, yeah, and looking at the data object real quick, we're gonna take another b -b byte code break and see okay, what is actually happening here just to prove to you that, hey, this might be something that you want to consider. Let's find, where was one of those movies? Here we go. And as you can see here, I've made it a data object and now here in, we can see what is generated is some of those things. You don't get the components that allow you to destructure these variables, but you do get the two string, the hash code, the equals, good stuff. So that is something that you can anticipate having in 1.9 if you haven't already turned it on already. So let's go ahead and move on. Um, so one of the, the features in Kotlin in the last four years that I have been super excited about 
are unsigned integers. I come from a C++ background, and in some native languages like C++, you know, C++ we've had for quite a while, you know, the ability to define certain integer types as being unsigned, that means that they can only represent values from zero to whatever um, is, is their, their upper end range in like the positive side of things. So we have that in Kotlin. I'm gonna make this just a little bit bigger. It's a little bit bigger. And so the two pieces of this for Colin are, of course, the types. So along with int, double, long, and all the other wonderful numbers, you have u, da 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 da, of those types. And that represents the unsigned version of that type. It has the same bit width, but a slightly different, you know, um, you know, uh, value range, of course, from zero to whatever the end range is. And to go with those, you also have suffixes for the literals, because whenever you do a literal, you have to, you know, give a clue onto what kind of literal it is. And so, you know, usually we have F for floats, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have for unsigned ints, U. And, you know, omitting that is no good because this is going to be a regular integer, so the compiler doesn't like that. And certainly, if you try to be sneaky and assign a negative value to this positive, uh, or to this unsigned int, rather, no go. So there we go, unsigned integers. Now, it, it might be tempting, and I was tempted too, to kind of take unsigned integers and use them to make your abstractions more realistic, right? Because, I mean, really, we can't have negative people, we can't have negative things. I mean, in terms of, like, the numeric value of negative, I'm sure there's a lot of negative people and things out there. Um, but, you know, it, it kind of, I think sometimes, you know, you really want your abstractions to really fit. And I know that that temptation to use unsigned ints, use the fact that they're only positive to do that, but that's actually not recommended by Kotlin in the official documentation. And there's a couple of good reasons for that. The first is that, you know, even though we have not had this ability to do strictly positive values, you know, in many languages, we've made use of those negative numbers, right? The negative numbers for signed integers and other value and other signed values get really handy as right as error signals, as marker values, because they exist kind of in that weird imaginary space that is negative. We can use them as exceptional cases. So of course, a lot of the collections API, you know, return minus one. If say you're looking for the index of something, some variant in this multiverse of did I say hotties? I think there was a multiverse of hotties. Um, sorry, hottie. Um, but anyway, like if say I have a list of variants, variant people, different versions of say hottie, I hope he's not listening, um, and I want to find the index of a particular hottie in my list, um, if it's not there, then I get a minus one. So again, using the fact that it is signed to communicate something. And so that is, you know, already a very widely used convention, and also it's just really handy. So. It not, it's not necessarily enhancing, you know, when we create models, when we create abstractions, when we create APIs to necessarily make it as accurate as possible. There is utility in those signed integers. So what the unsigned integers actually, actually are for is to use the full bit range of that integer, of that long or whatever, to represent positive values. And so let's take a look what that actually means. So if I have an unsigned byte, a byte is eight bits, Right, and we can use hexadecimal notation to, you know, to um, write values. And each hexadecimal code is four bits, right? So eight divided by four. I have two hexadecimal uh, literal characters here to represent the value of this unsigned byte. That makes sense. Bytes eight bits, two hexadecimal characters makes sense. I have a signed byte here. I have one hexadecimal character here. If I try to add another, I probably don't like it. So why is that? Well, it's because of the way that negative numbers are represented in the machine. So this is something I have not thought of in <clears throat> 20 years since college, but basically to represent negative numbers, Java uses something called two's complement. There probably could be a very boring talk all about this. It's actually kind of interesting. It's not that boring. Sorry, professor. Um, but basically, more or less, the way that Java represents signed integers is to take the most significant bit and this is very oversimplifying, but using that to indicate whether a number is positive or negative is actually cool math. But that means that if you have a 32-bit integer, if you want to represent a value, you actually are only using 31 of those bits, the first most significant bit being, of course, for the sign. So, I mean, that doesn't seem so bad, right? And naturally what happens is, you know, you'll just use the next largest uh, you know, uh, integer type to cover whatever value you actually want to represent. But 
that gets kind of messy when we are working with very established con you know, representations and conventions. So a, real, a one that might be super common, especially for all my you know, graphics UI family in the house, is ARGB codes. So a very common representation of you know, um, RGB colors is through this 32-bit integer and having you know, four separate pieces, uh, breaking that, in that integer down to three, uh, four separate eight-bit pieces. The math on that checks out, it does check out. And you know, so you have the alpha slash transparency panel, uh, channel, and then of course, red, blue, green. So traditionally, ideally, the way that this breaks down is that you have 32 bits, and then you have eight bits for each of these you know, components. Now, I have here a color, it's fuchsia. Um, at least I'm pretty sure it is. I, I'm kind of used to the Android studio telling me what color that is, but I'm going to trust that it's fuchsia. And so you can see here I have eight hexadecimal characters, so I have you know, an ability to represent you know, this color in ARGB. And it is actually a long. If I try to kind of make this into an int, no, no go, because of course the int doesn't, just doesn't have enough capacity to actually represent the value that I want, so it's actually a long. Now, this is where the unsigned integers come in. Because specifically they are unsigned, you don't have to bother with no twos complement, no losing of significant bits, you get to use the full you know, width of that integer to represent quantities like that. So this is kind of you know, very specific to you know, whatever your domain is, whatever your, you know, problem is, but it can be really handy to not have to worry about certain things, like the fact that, you know, these three values are conceptually and in many ways different, you know, values. You know, I have some minus number very, that's very large, I have a very large long number, and I have some presumably very large uh, unsigned integer number. So the problem is that, yeah, when you're working in graphics and even any kind of other kind of representation that kind of breaks down an integer into bits like this, there's a dissonance between the bits that are in the machine and the interpretation of those bits, right? So if you look down here, I've run this code and I've actually broken down the bits of each of those numbers. And it's, and if you can see between like the hexadecimal like format or the binary format, all three of these numbers have the exact same bits, you know, um, in the representations, but the interpretation of them, the meaning of them in the code is quite different and that's where it gets kind of messy and you know you have to convert from different things and make sure you've got the right types. So this is what unsigned is for to give clarity to these kind of you know seams where the ideal you know theoretical thing that we were representing is a little bit different when it's actually in like the bits and bobs of the bytecode. And um, yes, yeah, so if I have here the same fuchsia color in unassigned ints, you can see I can use like the full, um, the full integer and use like the nice hexadecimal notation, and it's less confusing. Uh, and generally speaking, you know, especially if you're in a position where you're interopting with a lot of native APIs like C++, uh, it can be handy to have, again, this unsigned representation because the mapping from, say, native APIs to Kotlin is a little bit more clean. So, Yes, unsigned integers are awesome. Yes, it's really cool that they go from zero to positive. But again, I think this kind of goes again to what is idiomatic Kotlin and kind of understanding what that means. And part of that is, of course, it's your code. You should do whatever is always best for your problem and your project. But it can be sometimes that making the best decision depends a little bit on understanding you know, what is behind this? What is the thinking? You know, it's not just enough to know the syntax. You need to know the semantics, the idioms, the conventions, the memes, if you will, behind that. And so I think it is handy kind of to, you know, understand that. And if you decide to use unsigned ins for whatever you want, that's your call. But it is interesting to know why these things are used and maybe the best decision comes on kind of comparing, you know, what we're told to do, what we should do, and what we actually do and figuring out the differences between those things. So, how do these unsigned integers work? Well, we're not going to take one of those breaks yet. I'm just going to click into the uint code and see what is this implemented. And oh, what is this? It's value class. So what is a value class? Well, this is actually an inline class. And inline classes came to Kotlin also in 1.5.0. That was a very stacked release, really fun. And so inline classes, ooh, this is a fun topic. Um, so what are inline classes? So I'll give you a kind of more dictionary explanation. Inline classes are a subset of value classes. What are those? We'll talk about that in just a second. So but basically, they are a wrapper around a single property. 
And what happens is that you can create this value class, you can use it as if it was a regular class, but eventually instances of that wrapper within your code will be actually inlined with the underlying property value. So before I get there, there is a lot of very interesting you know, discussion. I'm sure most of the super Kotlin enthusiasts in the room have already you know, heard about this, but I think what's really interesting for me as a developer with Kotlin is that it has exposed me to a lot of concepts, a lot of things that you know, I just never had experiences before. So Kotlin was my first experience with functional programming, with some of these different concepts where you know, I, I kind of worked more low level, and it was really nice to be exposed to kind of different concepts, different ways of thinking, and bringing that thinking, bringing those considerations into my own day-to-day -day life programming, which is awesome. And this was a rabbit hole that I went down recently, which is really cool. Explaining it is way above my pay grade, but there are some really amazing documents that the team has put out there, design notes, as well as content um, by Svetlana, uh, very recently kind of explaining this. But to kind of give you a very bad paraphrase of it, there's this idea of value classes. And so, you know, within Kotlin, we do have a number of primitive standard library classes like int, long, and double. And these aren't exactly primitives, right? They're wrapper classes, but they do have the advantage of, they do, they are able to take some, uh, take advantage of, you know, some primitive properties. And what's really interesting, and which is kind of what the concept that I'm trying to understand now, is that in this document, it says that, hey, these classes do not have a stable identity at all. And I think it's a really cool concept because, again, value classes, right, are classes that hold value. Now, a lot, most of the user-defined objects that we create in our, you know, um, in our development, in our programming, have identity, right? If I have my object one, my object two, they might hold the exact same value, but they might have the exact same, you know, property content, but they are still distinct objects. You know, if you use structural equality on them, the double equals, yes, they will come out as equal because structurally the content is the same, but they are, you know, they might be references to different, you know, instances of the object. So if you use re referential equality, the one, two, three, um, equals two different instances, despite having the same value, you know, will be, will, will not have referential equality. And it's, I guess just like, say if I'm an object, I'm not an object, but I might be an object, uh, and you just clone me and boom, there's a second win right there. Actually, my last name is Dow, so I might be a data access object, but that's like a whole nother like conversation beginner. But so if you just poop down magic, poof, there's another win right here, right? Same DNA, same like kind of atoms and stuff, but we are two distinct uh, people. We have two different identities, or maybe that's like a sci-fi movie in all of itself. So this is that kind of concept of identity. And there are things that are both, I think, from a theoretical abstract um, perspective, but also from just a performance perspective that, that these kind of like differences like imply and have impact on. And so with value classes, um, value classes are immutable classes that disavow the concept of identity. And so there are a lot of optimizations that can happen when you can treat two instances of something that have the same value as the same thing, right? Two ints are not two different ints. They, they, if an int is three and this int is three, they're just three. There's no inherent distinct identity. And so when we have value classes, it allows us to create user-defined classes. It allows us to have things like type safety, but at the same time to take advantage of this concept of the idea that these two things being of the same value are the same thing. And so we get into things like stack and, and heap and, and object allocations and the advantage of that. If you're super interested, and you pro if you are, you probably already know about Project Valhalla, which is basically kind of augmenting the current JVM model with value objects, with user-defined primitives. And of course, once JVM gets it, then us in Kotlin world get it too. There's a really great video where Svetlana talks about all of this much better than I ever could, and also kind of like the future project, the future like direction that this will go. And again, this is like just totally fascinating to me, right? This is just something that I think, you know, I might have heard of in my periphery that doesn't necessarily affect me now in my day-to-day -day Kotlin life. But again, I think something that's interesting about, you know, programming languages is that it's very much like human languages, right? They evolve, you know, and there is something of like, hey, I might know a vocabulary list of, I'm learning Japanese right now, so I might know, I might be able to memorize an entire vocabularies of Japanese, right? But if I don't have the grammar, then I can't actually make meaning there. And furthermore, even if I know, you know, the, the verbiage, the vocabulary and the grammar, there is still meaning, there's still semantics, there's still culture and memes and other things that add additional meaning, right? There are idioms that go in there. 
And I think that they, they come very much like Kotlin in any other, any other language, right? You can learn the syntax all you want. If you write it like C++ code, it's going to be C++ code just looking like Kotlin. So idiomatic starts to be more of using the grammar correctly, using, you know, applying these different, you know, ideas and concepts and conventions and memes, you know, into you know, the things that you create and the things that you write. And I think that's absolutely fascinating. Um, anyway, just go check that out. It's, again, way above my pay grade, but it's pretty cool. So in terms of value classes, you can create a value class. You give it one single property, and it wraps that property. You can use this class wherever you want um, in your code and get all the type safety, get to add, like, business logic around it. And ultimately what happens uh, at the end is that rather than having this class instance everywhere, you have instances of that actual, you know, property that, that it wraps around. So this is a totally, this is, this is actually a real life example that I did at work very recently. So I'm currently working on a video editor and there's a really cool, let me actually zoom in this like really, 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 so you can see it a little better. So there's actually a genuinely very cool time unit that was invented by Facebook. So when you're working with audio and video, you have to concern yourself a lot with frequencies, frame rates, all that stuff. And heaven help you trying to sync all these things together, right? Because these frame rates are just, there's no common multiples here. Some of them are floating point values. And working with video and, you know, computers is kind of tough, right? Because all of these different frequencies are just a mess in and of themselves. And then you throw floating point logic into that. And so to circumvent, you know, that problem, we really would like to work with nice round numbers. And so what basically flicks are is a unit of time that is 1,705,600,000ths of a second. That number basically is some lowest common multiple of all these very common, you know, frequencies added together, multiplied by 1,000. And so what happens is, is that we can work with these you know, frequencies and sampling rates and, and fr uh, frames per second in integers. Screw all that floating point double stuff, or floating point double stuff. Um, but yeah, this is actually what I do at work. We use all, we use specifically flick times, or flicks rather, for this, for, for this reason. And so it made a really, it made a, made a lot of sense, because really flicks are just, you know, can be represented as longs, but there is a ton of business logic that goes around it. How do I convert from frames per second to flicks? How do I convert from flicks to milliseconds? Because who wants to talk about 700,000, no, seven, seven, what did I say? 700 million of, you know, sec, uh, of, of time units when I'm kind of moving clips around. No one wants to do that. We want to use human readable things. So there's all this business logic, arithmetic, conversions, all this kind of stuff. And rather than having to deal with the fact that I have to have a class, uh-oh, more, uh, more instantiations in the heap, oh no, I can use this value class, have it be backed by this long, which is literally just the flicks, and then have all of this lovely, you know, niceties from Kotlin, operators, functions, and then all of that will get inlined appropriately in the bytecode. Oh, did I say bytecode? Is it time for a bubba bite code break? I think it is. So I have here some just samples of using that flick time class, using the conversions, using operators. And just to show you that, I don't know, I don't know why you think I was lying, but if we go into the actual code, you can see that yes, we do have, you know, some of the, you know, class constructors and things like that, but now they're private. And really, if I go down to my main, pardon for the scrolling, where is it here? If we go down to my main, and I'm going to close that. There we go. Um, we can see that really, kind of ignoring all of the, you know, um, muckety muck code. We can see that there are actually longs in here in place of those flick times. And if actually I had a class, like I say, I have a video class that has the duration in flick times. If I scroll up, I'm so sorry. Um, yes. So the, what was a flick time is now replaced with long. So. There you go. Uh, kind of having your cake and eating it too when it comes to the efficiency of possibly using primitive types uh, and also, you know, the, the niceties of having, you know, type safe classes. So inline classes. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit and talk about type aliases. Type aliases are not new, but I'm going to tie it back around, I swear. Um, so just quickly, um, I think, okay, so the reason I'm talking about this is that, you know, with this influx of new tools and influx of new ways to represent things, right, 
it, the question of what do I use for what is a very real and legitimate one. And I honestly think that, I'm not just conveniently trying to shoehorn this into my theme, but the choice of what to use where and what best you know, makes your representation and your abstraction is an important question, right? And there might be an answer that is super idiomatic. There might be an answer that is less idiomatic. And it's kind of knowing the rules, knowing the guidelines, knowing what makes something you know, more Kotlin-y, you know, it, knowing that allows you to make more informed decisions, right? Sometimes you gotta break the rules, but it's important to know what the rules are first before you break them. So just really quickly, type aliases are basically just shorthand for complex or verbose types. So say, you know, I have some very, you know, uh, complex types. We're gonna go back to the movie thing because I've been watching way too many movies lately and let me open that a little bit up. So say I have some kind of film class not like a film class, like a, like a, like a, you know, like a coding class, not like an actual like lecture. And uh, the film takes a couple, has a couple of generic parameters, one for the genre and one for the antagonist, you know, that is in this movie. And say like, I, I'm tired of writing all of these very long, you know, parameterized classes. I can use a type alias to create a shorthand, to create a nickname, you know, for these, you know, more verbose uh, types. So say I have a film, uh, you know, the genre is horror, but I kind of want to leave the antagonist open. I can write a very simple shorthand horror movie type alias and still have that, you know, one of the parameters kind of exist, uh, exist within that type. Um, say that I'm watching a film, the genre is survival horror, the antagonist is a zombie, I can just call that a zombie movie, rather than having to, you know, a cop, you know, um, you know uh, type all this out every single time. And that's kind of one of the main, I think, recommended use cases is kind of complex, you know, generics. The other kind of very recommended instance in which you want to use type aliases is for function types, because, you know, function types are amazing. It's really awesome that functions are first class citizens in Kotlin. But kind of looking at a lot, at, at, you know, kind of long, you know, long list, parameter list, or, or kind of wide swaths of function uh, signatures can get a little bit difficult, uh, especially because signatures often can be very similar. Um, I know, like, so I'm an Android dev, and a lot of times I've got a bunch of callbacks coming out from my composables, and maybe all of them are, you know, no parameters, you know, unit return type. You know, they're all the same signature, but they might have different semantics, they might have different meanings. So it's kind of nice to use, you know, type aliases to provide some clarity. And if you have some function type that just has like seven, a seven, you know, parameter long list, you get to type less. Um, there is something that's really important to note here, and that is that if the type, if the signature of whatever you're type aliasing matches another type alias, they are still um, assignment compatible. So this is not actually a new type, it's just an alias, it's a nickname. The underlying type beneath still exists. So I can have something here where maybe I have, you know, a handler to, you know, when some studio announces a new sequel, and I might have another handler that announces when, I don't know, someone's watched the movie for some reason. The signatures are the same, right? They're a single integer parameter returning, uh, or rather, uh, unit, uh, returning unit, unit function. So to me, they're different, but to the compiler, they're not. And so I can make mistakes where, say, I have the one handler, but then I pass it to you know, the wrong you know, property on something else because they're, they're assignment compatible. And that's something I actually forgot to mention with value classes. So with value classes, value classes, even though they will be ultimately inlined by whatever that you know, single property that's backing them, they are not actually, uh, they, be, they become their own types. So you do have some type safety there because you cannot have, you do not have assignment compatibility with whatever value class you have with the type of that single property that lives inside of it. So again, those are kind of like, I think as, as we're kind of getting all these new features and figuring out what do I need to use where, it's those small kind of details that can help you make the decisions that are best for you. And I'm running out of time, so let's talk really quick about SAM. SAM being single abstract method interfaces, or, you know, if you want to type it, it's not really its actual name, uh, functional interfaces. So what is a single abstract method uh, interface? Um, it's an interface with one abstract method. Um, and of course, um, SAM interfaces can have multiple non-abstract methods, but they are defined by this sing singular abstract method. And, you know, especially if you, you know, did a lot of Java before, you know, we had Kotlin, 
you remember what that was like. Um, you might have, you know, in adopting Kotlin, in kind of, you know, kind of getting into your interoperability story and adopting Kotlin, you might have had, you know, how to do with SAM conversions. Um, so Kotlin has had SAM conversions for a while, um, and they're specifically for interop with Java, Java functional interfaces. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to skip down and give you an example. Ooh, that is so tiny. So if we look at, wow, that is really tiny. Hold on. Let me, there we go. We'll pop it back in for everybody. So, you know, often in Java, before we all had lambdas, we would often have these, you know, single abstract methods, functional interfaces, as a kind of way of passing our own behavior in the same way that we do now with lambdas, but, you know, with the tools that we have with interfaces and functions. And so when you start getting into, like, you know, interoperability and adopting Kotlin, you might have this, you know, less ideal interface with a single method and you want to use lambdas. Well, you could have your cake and eat it too because very early on the Kotlin team gave us SAM conversions. And basically what a SAM conversion is, is being able to use a lambda in place of something like this, which would be an object expression implementation of this single abstract method. Uh, and basically rather than having to write this object expression, I can use a runnable and Kotlin will, the compiler will just take this lambda and do the work of, of actually, you know, creating an an, an object expression that implements this interface. Um, I don't have time for another bye -bye -bye code break, but we're just going to talk about functional interfaces. So again, what's interesting is that Kotlin always evolves as a language. And, you know, SAM conversions were originally just part of the Java interop story. You could not do, you know, this kind of syntax with Kotlin interfaces. And that was a specific language design choice because the team wanted us to focus on the fact and treat functions as first class citizens. But in real life, things are not so clean, and some of us, you know, have very different value-value use cases for wanting Kotlin interfaces to have similar syntax, right? We want to have, you know, compatible syntaxes, you know, between even our Java and Kotlin code. And so in, is it 1.5? I didn't take, make note of it. But, ver oh, actually, I think this is... I forgot where I put it, but, but we now have Kotlin interfaces, uh, functional interfaces, and if you add the fun keyword in front of a regular Kotlin inf interface, you can actually use this SAM conversion syntax, um, and you very explicitly have to use the fun. So you have to have the fun. So um, yeah, I, just to wrap up uh, very quickly, I'm sorry, um, there's all these new different features in Kotlin, and again, what idiomatic really means maybe ultimately doesn't matter, what really matters is what is best for you and what you are doing. But it is helpful, you know, as we're trying to express ourselves with Kotlin and any other language to kind of have an idea of what the grammar is, have an idea of what even the, in real people language, culture and history, but you know, conventions and memes and like patterns, and in order to make the best decisions that you can with your Kotlin. And yeah, idiomatic, what is idiomatic Kotlin is a great question, but even more important of a question is, what code is best to solve your problem. So yeah, that is my time. Um, and yeah, enjoy Kotlin Conf and definitely check out, you know, the documentation or the document on value classes is really cool stuff. But yeah, thank you for the time. Enjoy Kotlin Conf. <laughs> <laughs>